Good evening, everyone. It is presently 9.07 p.m. on Thursday, October 31st, 2019. Today we shall be reading Unintended Consequences, a novel by John Ross. Now, before I continue on, bearing in mind, as it is Halloween night, you will likely hear the sound of explosions in the background. Rest assured, that is fireworks, not celebratory gunfire. Please relax, we're not in the States. <laughs> anyway, continuing here. So, before I begin as well, another thing I would like to preface with regarding this text. Unintended Consequences is written effectively as a somewhat moderately libertarian propaganda piece in a similar vein to much of Ayn Rand's work. However, the choice of muse for it was not so much railroad companies, but rather something far more near and dear to my heart. The subject of which John Ross was concerned was the Second Amendment in the United States and firearms rights, as well as the rights of free people in every country. He wrote this text as a warning of sorts of what the potential consequences, intended or unintended, could be of, well, various forms of... He viewed it as a response to ever-escalating severity of gun laws in the United States and what he perceived as an encroachment of state tyranny on the freedoms of the people. This book was written, as I understand it, in the year 1996 although it appears he may have originally written it in 1957, or at least a rough draft thereof. Now, that being the case, even though this book isn't very new, it is still fundamentally exceedingly relevant in our present day. I mean, given the political situation in Canada currently, if for those not aware, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was recently re-elected for a second term, despite endless scandals from corruption to being caught doing blackface three times. It's honestly insane, but part of his new platform for re-election was an increase in gun laws in Canada, specifically a promise to potentially prohibit semi-automatic rifles and handguns, which would be quite detrimental to I would say the overall freedom of Canadian firearms owners as a whole, and honestly would not do much in the way of improving public safety, it could well make it worse. So added to that, you have the context in the US currently where President Donald Trump is in power, and although he is unlikely to implement much in the way of new gun legislation, he still has. I mean, there was the ban on bump stocks a couple of years, I'm not sure if it was a couple of years ago or last year, I would have to check, but there have been another a number of other sort of proposals that he has actively considered. So the Americans aren't out of the woods yet either. Now, in either case, as I was saying before, this book was written by John Ross with, I would say, two audiences in mind. His primary intended audience was gun owners in the United States, and he wanted to warn them of the potential impacts of government overreach and also make sure they understood fundamentally what the underlying purpose of the Second Amendment was. For those not aware, the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution was an amendment to the original document which added certain rights and protections for the people against potential tyranny. And the wording, although I don't have it memorized, was something to the effect of we the people finding it necessary to have a standing militia in order to defend the freedom of the country, deem it necessary that the people have the right to bear arms. And the intended purpose of that was fundamentally that the individual citizens, the sovereign citizens of the nation, should have the exact same firepower as any member of the standing army of a foreign power who might attack them or of the government's own military. And the fundamental purpose behind that was if there should ever come a day where the Constitution of the United States was not being respected by the government in power, and if there was some kind of a coup or what have you, then it was deliberately designed in such a way that the people could have the capacity to rise up 
in arms against that government and usurp them and reinstitute the fundamental principles of that constitutional document or draft a new one in its place. So as such, what that has guaranteed in the context of the United States is that by and large, the government is not as able to try and oppress its people if there is any potential situation there where they might consider it. I mean, as we speak, if we look in uh, the case of Hong Kong right now, the uh, mainland Chinese government currently has troops on the border of the borderline rebel province at this point, and they also have arranged for the Hong Kong police to crack down horribly on protests there in favor of equal parts a democratic system which may or may not help them, but also against the potential overreach of the central government in Beijing. And at least on that second point, I can concur with their assessment. If the mainland government in Beijing decides that it is going to wrest full control over the territory from the local populace, their rights will be se severely curtailed in terms of freedom of expression, in terms of their legal system, in terms of various different facets of their lives. Things will change very rapidly and not necessarily for the better. Now then, with that out of the way, there is a second audience of people that John Ross intended for this document to be read by, and that was representatives of the state security apparatus of the United States of America in the military and in the police and in the other various alphabet soup organizations that represent various facets of the government, so FBI, ATF, or I suppose as he pronounces it, BATFE, etc., etc., and his basic assessment was is he wanted any potential police officers or military generals or politicians to understand very fundamentally that if they ever were to push people too far, then there would be unintended consequences of that choice. And the ramifications would be severe and not easily stopped. Once that ball got rolling, it could be disastrous for all parties involved. And obviously, John Ross, he, in the forward to the text, which I'll read to you in a moment, he expresses very plainly, he has friends in law enforcement, and they advised him against publishing this under his own name. But he was willing to take that risk because he fundamentally believed that, one, the freedom of expression guaranteed under the U.S. Constitution must be exercised, and if it isn't, well, problems will result. And for another, he also believed that he had to stand by his principles and live and die by them. And I don't know if the man is still alive, but I can sincerely say that I respect that. Now, it being the case that I'm currently a criminology student who plans to get into policing work in the near future and who is also a firearms owner, it stands to reason that I am wholeheartedly the target audience of this book. So as such, this, from the parts that I've read thus far, I honestly believe this should be incorporated into the course syllabus for some kind of criminology course or program, at least this and other books related to it. I mean, fundamentally, if we can analyze texts written by radical groups, written by free-minded people who have a very potentially radical vision of the world, that have extreme views regarding certain subjects in one manner or another. And then you can analyze what their perspective is and the fundamental principles behind it to see if it holds water. That is something that everyone should learn how to do and master. That is a fundamentally important skill. So with that out of the way, I will first summarize briefly what the text is actually about, and then we'll dive in. So the text, Unintended Consequences, begins effectively with a history lesson of sorts for several chapters. We are told about the history of gun laws in the United States through a series of vignettes, and those little vignettes are tiny snapshots into what happens year by year, month by month, decade by decade, in the context of the United States, and some cases the larger worldwide context, with regards to gun rights for private citizens. And that process slowly cascades through the years until 
eventually our first and primary main character and all the other secondary characters of the main story are actually born. And then it follows them through the key moments of their various lives, again with an angle towards gun rights, and then eventually we get to what was considered to be the present day when he wrote this book, which is sometime in the 1990s. And at that point, our main character, who is at this point a very wealthy man, huge firearms collection, he works in the gun business, I believe, uh, selling transferable machine guns legally. For those not aware, yes, in the present day, machine guns are legal, but they have to have been produced prior to a certain year due to various regulatory things that actually he does delve into in the book, Mr. Ross, that is. So this character, he's a law-abiding citizen, he's wealthy, he's worked his way up in the world, he's well-respected and well-regarded by his community and everything else, and a corrupt, well, I'm not going to spoil much, but suffice it to say, the government decides that they have it out for him, and now he's forced to go on the run, but he certainly doesn't take it lying down, and he ends up staging more or less a, I want to say, almost guerrilla assassination campaign against those he perceives as being responsible. And then this sort of eventually escalates into a campaign against all government workers, and then there's a massive restructuring of the United States government. At least that's my understanding of it. Again, I haven't finished the book at the time of this recording. I'm going to be rereading the first probably 100, 200 pages of what is, in fact, a 749-page document. So please bear with me here. All right. So with that intro out of the way, we begin. Unintended Consequences, a novel by John Ross. We the People. Accurate Press, St. Louis, Missouri, published 1996. Library of Congress information here, originally published 1957, under the title of Unintended Consequences. This is the fourth edition that we are reading off of, rather an ebook copy thereof, and it says here, printed in the United States of America. Dedication. This book is dedicated to the three women in my life, my mother, Luciana Ross, who taught me by her example that you have to spend on your talent and do what you believe is right. My wife, Carolyn Ross, who urged me to start this project and who believed this book needed to be written. And my daughter, Lucy, who I hope will have more individual freedom when she becomes an adult than her parents did. Acknowledgements. I am indebted to a number of people for the help they gave me with this book. Much more than anyone else, Tim Mullen was a constant source of inspiration, not only for his friendship, encouragement, and advice, but also his encyclopedic knowledge of political history. Dr. Martin Fackler, Greg Jeffrey, Neil Knox, James Pat, Joe Tartro, and Aaron Zellman were invaluable in helping me flesh out the details of several of the real-life events portrayed herein. If any technical errors have crept into the text, the fault is mine, not theirs. I might add, having read some of the reviews for this text, it does in indeed appear that he gets some mo minor details of the timeline wrong, but the events he discusses are broadly true to form. Either way, continuing. In alphabetical order, Joe Adams, Colonel Rex Applegate, Dale Blaylock, Dave Cumberland, Richard Davis, Art Freund, John Holmes, John Huffer, Chief AJ, Lee Juris, Richard Kaiser, Al Amaldo La Scala, Bob Landis, Kent Lamont, Brace MacArthur, Stockley Meyer, Tim Mullen, David Scott, Donna Lan, Paul Reed, Britta Robinson, Dan Shea, Charlie Steen, Joe Tapscott, Pierre's Taylor, and Leroy Thompson all provided technical expertise in the areas of shooting competition, aerial shooting, small arms design, close quarters combat, accuracy, gunsmithing, load development, body armor, explosives and demolition, investigative techniques, field interrogation, live pigeon competition, African hunting, 
and desktop publishing. Franklin Y. Gladney at the University of Illinois, Urbana, was a great help with appropriate Slavic names. I would also like to thank the agents of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and the Secret Service, who helped me with sensitive background material, but who wish to remain anonymous. I am indebted to the All In Corporation for the photos of Ad Toppervine and Herb Parsons on page 18 and page 120. To the American Rifleman for the photo of Ed McGivern on page 123. To Gilbert Early for the photograph of the Cape Buffalo shot with a four bore on page 392. And to Caroline Van Stavern Ross for use of the lyrics to Poopy Diaper Baby. Evidently, that's a song written by someone who shares his last name, perhaps a member of the family. Passages quoted from the Guinness Book of World Records and Gun Week are used with permission. Most writers have had a mentor at one time or another. In my case, it is Robert Stone that I owe for giving me much needed criticism when my writing skills were first developing, and Stuart Kamnitsky for doing the same thing more recently. Albert Zuckerman at Writer's House, out of sheer kindness, also took time from his hectic schedule to counsel someone he barely knew on how to tackle this ambitious project. Last of all, I would like to thank my publisher, Greg Pugh at Accurate Press, for believing in this book and publishing it. This is a work of fiction with a storyline based on political history and historic precedent. The real-life events that comprise much of the book have been recreated to the best of my ability using as many sources as I could locate. Court documents, news footage, recordings of phone conversations and police radio transmissions, medical records, coroner's reports, FBI reenactment tapes, and sworn testimony of impartial eyewitnesses were all used. In some real-life events described herein, there are conflicting accounts as to what actually transpired. In these cases, I have chosen to describe the version that is consistent with the physical evidence and the various laws of nature. To help tell the story, I have at times invented specific thoughts and dialogue and ascribed them to real people. I did this where specific facts were non-existent or unobtainable, as in the case of people now dead or where the subjects were not available to be interviewed. The reader should remember that this is, fundamentally, a work of fiction. Alex Neumann, who first appears as a minor figure in one real-life event, is a product of my imagination. So are all members of the Bowman, Mann, Collins, Betterson, Caswell, and Johnson families, and virtually everyone in the quote-unquote present-day, current-year section of the book. Real-life figures in this story are used fictitiously. Finally, for those readers who have no experience with the shooting sports, all the shooting feats described in this novel are achievable. The more difficult would require roughly the same amount of talent as you would expect of a 10-year-old who was serious about mastering a musical instrument and who had been playing for two or three years. The most difficult accomplishments, in this author's opinion, are some of those achieved by the late Ed McGivern. Anyone interested in accurate speed shooting would do well to read his book, Fast and Fancy Revolver Shooting, which is once again in print. Author's note, a warning and disclaimer. A friend of mine in law enforcement told me that because of this book's content, I should not let it be published under my own name. Violent events happen in this story and our country's current political situation is such that these events could indeed come to pass. My friend's fear was that this book might precipitate such violence. He told me to expect to have drugs planted in my car during routine traffic stops, or have other similar miseries befall me and my family. 
he advised me that if I did have this work published, I should use a pseudonym, employ an intermediary for all publisher contact, and in general prevent myself from being linked to the finished work in order to avoid reprisals. However, I didn't do that, not only because of free speech considerations, but because I disagree with my friend's hypothesis. I believe that if the instigators glimpse what may lie ahead, they will alter their behavior before wholesale violence becomes unavoidable. It is my sincere hope that this book will reduce the likelihood of armed conflict in this country. History has shown us that government leaders often ignore the fundamental fact that people demand both dignity and freedom. Because of this disregard, these decision makers then initiate acts that are ultimately self-destructive. To illustrate this point, I will remind the reader of the origin of two of modern history's most destructive events, and of all the warning flags that were frantically waving while the instigators rushed headlong towards the abyss. In the late 19th and very early 20th centuries, European leaders formed two major alliances. Germany, Austria, and Italy comprised one coalition, and Britain, France, and Russia the other. Belgium remained neutral per an 1839 treaty signed by all of these nations except Italy. The smaller European countries became indirectly involved in the two aforementioned alliances. One such example was Serbia a country Russia had pledged to aid in the event of war between Serbia and Austria. Despite Russia's presence, Austria annexed a large part of Serbia, a province called Bosnia, in 1908. Few people remain emotionally indifferent when their culture and country are taken over by an aggressor, and the Bosnian Serbs were no exception. Many Bosnians despised the government that had chilled their independence. In spite of this obvious fact, the Austrian leaders sent an archduke to the capital of Bosnia to survey the people Austria now ruled. This archduke was replendent in full military ceremonial dress, festooned with medals and other military decorations, and accompanied by his elegantly dressed wife. An objective observer might, at this point, have said, stripping motivated people of their dignity and rubbing their noses in it is a very bad idea. Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife arrived in Sarajevo in an open vehicle, and the only protection either of them had was their chauffeur. This man was expected to drive the car and at the same time protect the Archduke and his wife with only a six-shot revolver he carried in an enclosed holster, and no spare ammunition. Our theoretical observer might have said, this is a recipe for disaster. Almost as soon as the Archduke and his wife arrived in Sarajevo, a Serbian national tossed a bomb under their car. Its fuse was defective and the bomb did not explode. Here our observer might have advised, a miracle has happened. Go home. Now. Immediately. Despite this obvious wake-up call, the royal couple shrugged off the assassination attempt and continued their tour of the Bosnian capital. Later that same day, a second Serbian national shot them with his 32 caliber pistol, killing them both. The Austrian leaders blamed the Serbian government for the assassination and demanded a virtual protectorate over Serbia, issuing Serbia a list of demands. Serbia acceded to all but one of Austria's stipulations. Here, our observer might have said to Austria's leaders, Russia has pledged to aid Serbia in any war with you, and Russia has both powerful allies and powerful adversaries. Serbia has agreed to almost everything you demanded. Settle and avoid a world war. Instead, Austria shelled Serbia's capital with artillery fire. Our observer might here have told Russia's leaders, Serbia is not worth starting a world war over, but Russia honored its commitment to Serbia and mobilized its army, sending troops to the Russian-Austrian border. 
Since this left Russia vulnerable to attack from Austria's ally Germany, the Russian army mobilized against Germany as well. This forced the German army to mobilize. Since France was allied with Russia, the Germans feared an attack by France in the west while German troops went east. So Germany decided to invade France immediately via Belgium. Here our observer might have said, saying this is your destiny is not going to be good enough, Germany. When you invade a neutral country and rape their women and slaughter their livestock and burn their houses, Britain is not just going to look the other way. When the Germans invaded Belgium, Britain honored its commitment to defend Belgian neutrality and declared war on Germany. Every major country in Europe was now at war. Four years later, over 30 million people were dead, half of them killed directly in the war itself and the rest so weakened through shortage of food and medicines that they succumbed to the influenza epidemic. In addition to the lives lost, the war's monetary cost in 1918 was almost $300 billion. No sooner had the war ended than the victors demanded their pound of flesh at the Treaty of Versailles. The treaty required Germany to accept sole responsibility for causing the war. It dictated that Germany and her military leaders were to be tried as war criminals. It prohibited the German army from possessing heavy artillery. It abolished the German general staff and the German air force and prohibited Germany from producing military aircraft. As in 1914, our observer might have said, stripping motivated people of their dignity and rubbing their noses in it is a very bad idea. But if such words were in fact uttered, they fell on deaf ears. A humiliated Germany was ripe for the National Socialist message of Adolf Hitler, and in this fertile soil were planted the seeds of the Second World War. Today in America, honest, successful, talented, productive, and motivated people are once again being stripped of their freedom and dignity, and having their noses rubbed in it. The conflict has been building for over half a century, and once again, warning flags are frantically waving while the instigators rush headlong towards the abyss and their doom. It is my hope that these people will stop and reverse their course before they reach the point where such reversal is no longer possible. Note from the author, John Ross, September 1995. Next here. Forward by Timothy Mullen. For those of you who pause to read this introduction before plunging headlong into this book, I would like to say a few brief words, perhaps to help you better appreciate the work. The voyage on which you are about to embark will be an enjoyable one, yet one which is an important trip. This book chronicles an attempt to destroy a culture, and it also gives at least one view of a possible resolution to this issue. I was present when John Ross first started writing this story, and I spent many enjoyable hours reading the initial draft of the material and discussing the storyline. I predict you will feel good just reading of the characters and their experiences. Many of them will seem like old friends that you once knew, now perhaps long gone. This novel tells the tale of a young man growing up with classic American values and living immersed totally in the gun culture. His story is much like that of a Native American who grows up in a society where the rules were simple, to ride, shoot straight, and speak the truth. To quote a well-known advertisement, you will find much that is familiar in all of the characters herein, and you will no doubt feel at home with them. Others who seek to stamp out this gun culture will be appalled at the valor portrayed here of free men who seek to live their lives unfettered by government chains. So much the worse for them. Hm. Guns are an important element in any truly free society. For a society that does not trust its citizens with individually owned weapons really does not trust its citizens at all. However, words are also important, and in this book, 
many will no doubt be encouraged to continue the good fight to protect a cultural value that is worth defending vigorously. By making it clear that the attack is not on guns, but rather on a cultural group, this story may provide much inspiration to the millions of people who are in that group. In recent years, we have witnessed violent attacks on people in the gun culture. These attacks amount to genocide, to cultural genocide. It is my hope that this book will cause those who blindly seek to destroy the gun culture to pause for a moment and recognize that their random actions are in error and to reconsider their evil ways. This could come from an intellectual conversation and a new appreciation of the culture's values. It could also result from a pragmatic concern for the inevitable consequences of continuously attacking a cultural group who wishes simply to be left alone and whose overriding philosophy is one of freedom. Either way, it doesn't really matter. The goal is to stop the attacks and prevent a violent confrontation which could prove harmful for all parties concerned. Enjoy the book, follow the character's action, and think of old friends as you find yourself drawn into the story. Remember that to the anti-gun zealots of HCI et al, this book will be like a nightmare penned by Stephen King. Note from T.J. Mullen. T.J. Mullen is a former captain in the United States Army who has taught police weapons training for more than 20 years. He is the author of Training the Gunfighter, which Elmer Keith said was one of the 10 best books ever written on the subject, and the Testing the War Weapons series. The first volume, The 100 Greatest Combat Pistols, is now available from Paladin Press. Mr. Mullen currently practices law in St. Louis, Missouri. Here we begin the prologue. Present day. It was late afternoon when he finally heard them coming to kill him. The wind was blowing gently towards him, and it carried the sound well. Two choppers. He judged from the pitch of the engines, possibly three. Henry realized that his first emotion upon hearing the sound of rotor blades approaching was an overwhelming sense of relief. The waiting was finally over. His next thought concerned the relatives of the men that were about to die. The widows will never understand that their husbands died because the government got a little too heavy-handed after June of 1968. <sighs> he scanned the sky until he spotted the aircraft approaching from the north. That isn't quite right. The Kennedy and King killings weren't the first links in the chain that dragged us here. No, the death sentence was handed down before World War II. Henry settled in behind the big solothurn and checked his field of view through the weapon's optical sight. The gleaming example of Swiss craftsmanship had been manufactured in 1939. The irony was not lost on Henry Bowman. In March of that year, the United States Supreme Court had heard a case involving a moonshiner who had been arrested in 1938. A federal district court had thrown out the charges as being unconstitutional, and the government had appealed. At the hearing, something very unusual had happened. Neither the moonshiner nor his lawyer had seen fit to appear before the court to argue the case. They didn't even bother to file a brief on the moonshiner's behalf. The court ruled for the government, judicial precedent was set, and the issue was never again heard by the Supreme Court. The 1939 ruling became the foundation on which many additional laws were constructed. Supreme Court's been ducking that issue ever since, Henry thought, as he strained to hear a change in the approaching noise. <laughs> well, guys, the tide has finally turned. It's time you thugs had a little history lesson. I don't suppose you're familiar with what happened in the Warsaw Ghetto in 1943. A wry smile appeared on his lips, as Henry remembered something. It's just like the story Uncle Max told me when I was a kid, about Billy Dell pulling a Paul Bunyan. Henry Bowman's right hand tightened around the walnut grip of the Solothurn S18-1000. The weapon had been a present from his father, given to him on his 14th birthday in 1967. Cost, $189.50. Back in the 60s, Henry thought irreverently. 
I thought that was a steal. Dad's friends thought it was astronomical. <laughs> Wonder what they'd think now. As he followed the progress of the helicopters through the binoculars, Henry Bowman reflected that the 1930s era weapon would now likely cost over 10,000 current dollars to manufacture. It had been made in a time when production methods and philosophies were much different. Fewer than 500 of the obsolete Swiss guns had been imported over a 10-year period in the 1950s and 1960s, before the law change. Pay attention here, guy, Henry kidded himself as he focused on the problem at hand. You don't get any practice runs with this one. Henry twisted his head methodically and arced his back as he lay there, on his stomach, working the stiffness from his body. He had lain prone for over an hour with his face pressed against a pair of binoculars, and he needed to be loose for what he was about to do. The helicopters appeared over a ridge that Bowman had previously determined was a little more than two miles distant. They were following a heading that would have them to the spot that he had selected next to the water-filled quarry pit. He steadied the binoculars by resting his right wrist on the top of the Solothurn's receiver and cranked the zoom control from 10 power all the way up to 20. The binoculars amplified the heat waves in the air that are invisible to the naked eye and called mirage by competition shooters who use high magnification optical sights. The boiling, shimmering image in the glasses gave a surrealistic appearance to the approaching choppers, but Henry could make them out well enough. Three of them. Bell Turbine Model, Jet Ranger, or its descendant. A door gunner with a belt-fed machine gun poking out the right side of each one. Possibly the Belgian Mag-58, but more likely M-60s, he thought with derision. They should have brought armored Apaches carrying napalm, he thought. <laughs> or nukes. A grin split his face. Oh, those poor, sorry bastards. <laughs> All right. That concludes the prologue. Part one. Seeds. We begin here with a quote. The sun no longer shows his face, and treason sows his secret seeds that no man can detect. Fathers by their children are undone. Might is right, and justice there is none. Walter von der Vogelweit. No clue who that is. I need to look that up. Chapter 1. December 11th, 1906. The two and one quarter inch pine cube spun in the air, and a cheer went up from the crowd as the wood block bounced in the dirt. There was a gray ringing hole through the center of it. That's the last one, Top, one of the men said unnecessarily. 50,000 with only four misses. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't been here. <laughs> the lean mustachioed rifleman with the broad brimmed black hat lowered his gun to waist level. It was a Winchester Model 1903, a semi automatic rifle introduced three years prior. It held 10 rounds of 22 auto a new rimfire cartridge loaded with the recently developed smokeless powder. Ammunition loaded with black powder, such as many existing stocks of 22 long, would foul auto-loading weapons in short order. The man withdrew the magazine tube from the rifle's buttstock and dumped the five remaining rounds into his hand, then worked the action and ejected the round that was in the chamber. He handed the empty rifle to one of his loaders, who was already holding a second Model 1903. Adolf Topperwein held the world's long-run record for percentage shooting of aerial targets with a rifle. The rules regarding this sport had been laid out by the exhibition shooter's document Carver three decades before. Targets were to be wooden cubes or clay balls not more than two and a half inches across, and were to be thrown vertically 20 to 30 feet in the air by a person standing not less than 25 feet from the shooter. Other long-run shooters had shot at 50,000 targets, but they had all missed more often. The previous record, Holder, had missed 280 targets out of 60,000. The young thrower bent over and picked up the final block. Instead of tossing it onto the pile with the others, he walked over to Toppervine and handed it to him. Top reached out gingerly and took it from the boy. 
His arm and back muscles were screaming in protest from being made to throw a rifle to his shoulder once every four seconds, 80 straight hours a day, for a full week. It was an effort for him just to remain standing. Ad Toppervine examined the piece of wood, noting that he had hit it almost dead center, then looked over at the mound of blocks he had shot in the past week. The pile was 80 feet high and over 30 feet in diameter. He tried to massage his arm muscles, but his own fingers had no strength. Ready for a hot bath and a soft bed? Ad's wife Pinky asked. Or can I get you some lunch first? Pinky Toppervine was also an exhibition shooter for Winchester. The company had hired her after she had set a world trap shooting record in 1904 at the St. Louis World Fair. Not yet, hon, he said to his wife. If it's not too hard for you, Mr. Toppervine, we'd like you to sit on top of the pile of blocks for a picture. This was the San Antonio State Fair's organizer speaking. Toppervine gave a slight grin. Sure, I'll climb up there. It may take a little longer than normal, that's all. He turned to one of his loaders. We've got use of the fairgrounds and the assistance paid for another three and a half days. Ed? Seems a shame to waste it. He narrowed his eyes. Cap Bartlett shot 60,000 back in 89. Top nodded at the huge pile of wood cubes. Have the kids go through and pull out the ones that aren't split in two. I want to keep going. His loader's jaw dropped in astonishment. And get a hold of the Winchester rep. Tell him we're going to need more ammo by tomorrow afternoon. Six cases, just to be on the safe side. He pitched the 50,000th block underhanded onto the pile where it had disappeared among the others. I'm going to take about 20 minutes to cool off these arms and get a sandwich. Let's get going again after 1.30. He turned to the photographer. Just before I start shooting again, I'll climb up there for your picture. Pile isn't going to get any bigger, but uh, no awards or any of that stuff. I got a few more good shots in me. Let's see where we end up, eh? He turned and started back towards his trailer, leaving the knot of helpers and spectators standing there speechless. When the San Antonio fairgrounds closed on December 15, 1906, Ad Toppervine, using three semi-automatic Winchester 1903 rifles, had shot at 72,500 wooden blocks thrown into the air. He had missed nine. More than a half century later, another man employed by Remington would hit over 100,000. His throwers, however, would stand by his left shoulder and gently toss the blocks straight out along the same path that the bullet would take. Top's record, shot under the rules laid out by another man in the 19th century, would never be broken. In 1906, skilled riflemen were universally admired, and people like Ad and Plinky Toppervine spent much of their time urging young boys and girls to learn gun safety and hone their shooting skills. The phrase did not exist in 1906 when Top set his record, for a special term was unnecessary. But years later, the fact would be self-evident. Ad Toppervine and his wife Plinky were part of the gun culture. And we have here a picture of Mr. Toppervine sitting on top of his wooden blocks at the fair. God, that is a huge pile. All right. Chapter 2, May 10th. 1918. Matt, I know I've been dealing with these government people for 30 years, but I tell you, I will never get used to it. I had the water-cooled gun finished almost 20 years ago, and offered it to them then for next to nothing. They didn't show a lick of interest until after our country joined the war. It's not as if they didn't have any advanced warning either. Germany has a quarter million 8mm Maxims up and running. A gust of wind threatened to blow John Browning's hat off. He pushed it further down on his head, then went on. What did we have when we entered this war, huh? Less than 200 of my old air-cooled 95 Colts, a few hundred of those French things, and less than 300 Colt 1904 Maxim guns. Every one of those weapons is an entirely different design, and not one was originally designed to use the current issue 30 caliber round. John Browning knew he was repeating himself, but he simply couldn't help it. 
He also knew his brother would let him go on as soon as he liked. I had the Model 1901 water-cooled medium machine gun ready to go almost two decades ago, he thought. The government showed a complete lack of interest in it. What was particularly maddening to John Browning was that he was not some stranger the government had never heard of. Browning was the man who had made the country's first gas-operated machine gun in 1889 had demonstrated for the Navy in 1891 a machine gun which fired 1,800 rounds in three minutes without a single stoppage, and who had designed the first machine gun ever used by the United States military, the Model 1895 Colt Potato Digger machine gun adopted by the U.S. Army in that year. In 1900, three quarters of the sporting arms made in the United States were Browning designs. With sidearms, it was Browning's model 1911 45 caliber automatic that the government had adopted when 38 caliber army revolvers had failed to stop the crazed Moro warriors during the Philippine insurrection in 1898. So as I was saying, last year, John went on, with the country on the brink of war, the War Department finally realizes that U.S. soldiers armed with handguns and bolt-action rifles are going to face hundreds of thousands of Maxim machine guns already in use by the German army. John Browning shook his head. He did not say it, but he was thinking of the great irony of this. Hiron Maxim, an inventive genius, the equal of John Browning, was an American. Maxim, however, had no prior designs which had been adopted by the United States Armed Forces and had taken his inventions to Europe, where their value had been immediately appreciated. Now, hundreds of thousands of American soldiers would face these lethally efficient weapons designed by an American, but manufactured by seven German arsenals and issued to German troops. I have serious doubts about this idea of walking fire, John said to his brother, but my gun will do it all right. You got it done faster than you said you would, too, Matt said. The U.S. government had implored John Browning to design an automatic rifle that could be carried by one man and fired with full control, from the hip on full automatic. It was the expert's theory that a line of soldiers equipped with such weapons could sweep an area clean. Browning had obliged with the 17-pound Browning automatic rifle whose design had been finalized three short months after the government's initial request. John and his brother, Matt, were now on their way from New Haven to the Winchester firing facility on the waterfront bordering Long Island Sound. The Browning Automatic Rifle, or BAR, was now just going into production, and the inventor had been asked to be present at an official demonstration for military observers. As the two men walked towards the firing range, John Browning continued the largely one-sided conversation with his brother. Now that they've finally got the gun into production, just about in time for the end of the war, they want us up here to watch them shoot it. What use that's going to do, I have no idea. Despite his grousing, John Browning loved military demonstrations of his designs, and was secretly glad to be going to yet another one. His weapons always delivered more than the authorities expected. At the official demonstration of the Browning Model 1917 water-cooled belt-fed machine gun in May of that year, the weapon had digested 40,000 rounds of ammunition without missing a beat. It had finally succumbed to the malfunction most common to John Browning's designs. It ran out of ammo. <laughs> I wish to heaven the BAR could have been in our soldiers' hands this time last year. I looked at that French Chocha they've been trying to make do with. It's a disaster. I'd be afraid to fire it. Val says in the 79th they plug the bore and fire them with a string to blow them up, so no one will use them in combat. Matt Browning was referring to his nephew, John's son, who was currently stationed in France. The family received letters from him regularly. Let's hope Uncle Sam sends the first batch of BARs to his division then, eh? They ought to, with the deal you agreed to. John Browning had sold the rights to the BAR for $750,000 outright. Under standard military contract terms, Browning would have ultimately received 20 times that amount in royalties. 
The first shipment of BAR's would, however, go to Val, Browning's division, the 79th in July of 1918. Don't begrudge them our agreement, Matt. I'm 62 years old. I wouldn't have lived long enough to see much more in royalties than they already gave me. And as for the family, the royalties for the auto shotgun will pull more from the civilian market than my children could spend in a dozen lifetimes. I think you're right about that. Matt Browning smiled at the memory of his brother's refusal to sell the patent for the Auto 5 outright. Up until 1902, every Browning design had been sold for cash to either Winchester or the United States government. Because of John Browning, Winchester had a lock on the sporting arms market. With the auto shotgun, John had demanded a royalty contract, and Winchester had refused. It was one of the costliest mistakes that company would ever make. Fabrique Nationale, or FN, in Belgium had agreed to Browning's terms, starting a mutually profitable relationship that would endure until the designer's death in 1926 at the age of 71. In 1918, FN was producing the Auto 5 shotgun and several Browning-designed automatic pocket pistols. The firm would come to manufacture John Browning's superposed shotgun, his 14-shot 9mm P35 high-power pistol, a fine pump-action 22 caliber rifle, and eventually several refinements of the BAR that the inventor and his brother were about to see demonstrated. So, what do they have planned for this little get-together? Matt asked his older sibling. <sighs> Undoubtedly, the standard routine. Reliability demonstration, show of controllability, ease of handling, all that. John said these words without rancor. Although such events had become commonplace, it still pleased the inventor a great deal to see in operation the weapons he had designed. I'd also be amazed if they don't have some guy who's been practicing blindfolded, stripping, and reassembling the thing. Ever since I showed them that trick, they've been talking about it. I think the army's apt to make it part of their training regime with all of their weapons. John Browning was right about the blindfolded demonstration, and about the coming decision to make it a part of basic training. He was also right about reliability and controllability being the standard elements of the exhibition. Browning was asked to be part of the demonstration, as had been his custom with earlier sessions involving other Browning designs. This, as always, pleased the inventor. What John Browning did not know was that the people in charge had prepared an additional element as part of the afternoon's coming activities. Gentlemen, the Winchester representative said to the spectators assembled near the shore of the Atlantic Ocean, you have all seen the reliability power and controllability of the new Browning Automatic Rifle, or BAR. It gives the infantryman effectiveness he has heretofore only dreamed about. Production is underway, and in a matter of weeks, the first shipments of these guns will be in the hands of some of our troops. He paused to let this information sink in before continuing. Many of you may assume that this weapon is of necessity much more cumbersome to handle than the Krag or Springfield, and that as a machine rifle, it is of little use firing single shots. However, that is not true, as you will now see. As the Winchester rep said the words, John Browning watched a slender man of about 45 with a mustache step up to the firing line. Strong gusts of wind were blowing in from offshore, and the man removed his hat and laid it on the table weighing down the brim with two loaded magazines. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Ad Toppervine, who works for us. He's going to give a little demonstration of just how manageable this rifle is on single fire. I'll let him tell you what he's going to do. The factory representative stepped aside and took a seat. Toppervine held up some steel discs for the audience to see, and then addressed the crowd. It's a very windy day today and we need a target that won't blow around so much. The fellows in the machine shop had some inch and a half steel rod, and I asked them to chuck it up in the lathe and cut off some quarter inch thick sections. He held one of the steel discs edgewise for the audience to view. They shouldn't move around too much in the wind, he explained. What's this fellow think he's going to do with them? 
John Browning whispered to his brother. Shoot them out of the air with a 17-pound machine rifle that fires from an open bolt? It soon became apparent that that was exactly what Ad Toppervine intended to do. The audience watched with rapt attention as an assistant took a stack of heavy steel discs and stepped seven or eight paces away from Toppervine towards the ocean. Top picked up one of the BARs that had just been used in the endurance demonstration, pulled back the bolt, and inserted a loaded 20-round magazine. He held the weapon at waist level. All 20 face on. Throw the next one as soon as you hear the shot, Toppervine instructed his thrower. The man nodded and tossed the first disc 20 feet into the air, spinning it like a phonograph record so that it did not tumble. Top threw the BAR to his shoulder, and the gun fired as the disc neared the apex of its ascent. Immediately, the thrower sent another disc aloft. In less than 30 seconds, Top had fired 20 shots. The audience had strained to watch the discs move, or to hear the impact of the bullets on them. It appeared that some of them had wobbled, but the muzzle blast of the weapon drowned out any noise of bullet impacting steel. I think he hit a couple of them, Browning said to his brother with genuine admiration in his voice. At 62, John Browning averaged over 95% at trap shooting, and he could not imagine hitting a single one of the steel discs using a machine rifle firing from an open bolt. The audience watched the thrower walk around and pick up the 20 steel discs that lay on the ground. When he brought them over to the group for their inspection, John Browning drew his breath in abruptly. <sighs> All 20 discs had three-eighths of an inch holes in them, very near the center in each case. The metal had flowed back in a lip around the circumference of each hole, as is typical when a high-velocity bullet meets mild steel and each hole was washed with silvery metal from the cupro nickel jacket of the 30 caliber bullet. The current issue round is a 172 grain bullet, but I'm shooting up some old stock with the 150 grain slug. What the soldiers are getting now is much better at long range, but the 150 is faster up close, and it's a lot faster than the old crag load, Top explained. It goes through quarter-inch mild steel without giving much notice. He removed the empty magazine from the gun and replaced it with a full one. Put them all up again, same way, only edgewise this time, he instructed his thrower. Stand a couple steps closer. This gets a little harder, he nodded. The man scaled the first disc upwards with its edge to Topper Vine and the crowd, and Top threw the BAR to his shoulder. This time, when the gun fired, the blast was followed by a howling noise as the disc was driven spinning far out over the ocean. The thrower immediately scaled the next one into the air with identical results. In a short time, 18 of the steel discs had been sent screaming out over the water, hit on the edge by a one-third ounce bullet traveling at over twice the speed of sound. Top had missed two of the targets. He put the BAR back on the table and went to pick up the two discs he had missed. Ad Toppervine examined them, then turned to the awestruck crowd. I don't have much experience with machine guns, he allowed, but the BAR is one of the smoothest operating rifles I have ever fired. I think all of us should thank Mr. Browning here, not only for his superb rifle, but for all of the fine weapons he has put in the hands of our servicemen. John Browning said nothing. He was still thinking about what he had just witnessed. John Browning was also part of the gun culture. This concludes Chapter 2. Chapter 3, War Trophies, is next. Chapter 3, War Trophies. April 18th, 1919. Back home at last, the 23-year-old soldier thought with a smile as he stretched his arms and legs. Lieutenant Cameron Wilcox Bowman listened as the brakes squealed and the train slowed to a crawl. A blast of steam was released from the boiler, and the locomotive slowly pulled the railroad cars into the station in Kansas City. Cam! His brother Mitchell yelled in greeting from the platform. Hey, I didn't even recognize you. Lord, is that gray hair you're getting? The soldier said as he stepped onto the platform and looked his brother over. Now how did that happen? 
Mike was 10 years older than his brother Cam. He was not getting gray hair. How's the baby? was the next thing Cameron asked. Mike's wife had given birth to a son just before the United States of America had entered the war. Cam suddenly looked horrified. Flu didn't get him, did it? Oh no, we missed that, thank God. But he's not much of a baby anymore. He's almost two years old and running around everywhere. Wait till you see him. You're gonna just die. <laughs> what on earth do you have in there? Michael Bowman demanded. They had located Cam's bags and were muscling them out of the freight station. Oh, uh, I brought you back a few things, the lieutenant said. Like what? The anchor from your troop's ship? This thing weighs a ton. Picked up some guns and brought them back with me. Jerry's didn't need them anymore. Brought you a Luger, also got a 45 auto I'd like you to have. Not many of the troops got them in time, but my unit was led by the son of the guy who designed it, so I got one. Got a BAR, too, if you can believe that. Thought maybe they'd squawk when I stuck it in my bag, cause they're so new. Figured I'd give it up if anybody asked. Nobody said a word, though. Oh lord, they better not have, Michael said immediately. You earned it, I'd say. Now what's in here? He judged that the bag must have weighed a hundred pounds. Got a Maxim and a Schwarz Laws in that one, Cam answered. He glanced around the station platform. Let's see if we can find a wagon or a cart or something. Michael Bowman grinned and shook his head. It's not too far to the truck. Come on, we got lots of time. At train stations all across the country, similar scenes were being played out as servicemen happily returned home. Most of them, like Cam Bowman, brought both domestic and foreign ordnance back with them in their belongings. United States service weapons were technically considered government property. But at the end of the war, many soldiers felt that they had earned the right to keep the arms they had carried through the mud while bullets flew around them. Few combat veterans in positions of authority disagreed with this attitude. In addition to issue arms, virtually every soldier who had served overseas had, like Cam Bowman, brought home captured foreign weapons. Mauser and Luger semi-automatic pistols were universally admired for their worksmanship, accuracy, and rapid delivery of shots. They also had detachable shoulder stocks the German craftsmen had designed for them so that they could be converted into short, light, medium-range carbines. It was a rare doughboy who had returned to the United States without at least one of these handsome weapons in his duffel bag. The stock for the Mauser pistol doubled as the weapon's holster. The one Bowman had liberated had been peppered with the same shrapnel that had killed its former owner. The stock was perforated in three places, and the magazine well of the gun itself had a dime-sized gouge in it. Looking at the gun was a reminder of what often happened to soldiers in combat. Mauser bolt-action rifles were quite common war trophies, and a few soldiers even brought back the huge 45-pound .56 caliber Mauser anti-tank rifles to impress the folks back home. Cam Bowman had had one of the massive weapons, but he had lost it in a shipboard poker game on the voyage home. Most highly prized of all, though sometimes awkward to transport, were the fully automatic machine guns brought back from France and Germany. The little nine pound German MP18 Schmeiser that was wrapped in Cam Bowman's trousers inside his duffel bag fired the same nine millimeter pistol cartridge as the Israeli Uzi and Heckler and Koch or H and K submachine guns that would be used by the United States Secret Service half a century later. These later arms, however, would be made of steel stampings and molded plastic and would not exhibit the same fine finishing or machining of the 1918 era weapon. The German Maxim and Austrian Schwarz Loss that Cam Bowman had liberated were large, belt-fed, water-cooled machine guns fired from bipod and tripod, respectively. The Maxim was the better of the two, and this was evidenced by the fact that Hiron Maxim's basic 1884 design would still be in use by major world powers such as Great Britain up until 1962. As the Bowman brothers lugged the heavy cases out of their vehicle, other soldiers from the train poked through the piles of baggage to find their own belongings. Almost every serviceman's bag contained at least one war trophy that the young man intended to hang over the mantel, shoot on weekends, or give to a friend. 
Of the hundreds of thousands of soldiers returning home, not one of them could have imagined that in the future, citizens like themselves would be judged unfit to possess the very arms they had used to defend their country. End Chapter 3, War Trophies. Chapter 4, Veterans Bonus Strike, Washington, D.C., United States of America. July 16th, 1932. Take it from me, this is the greatest demonstration of Americanism we've ever had. Pure, unadulterated Americanism, willing to take this beating as you've taken it. Stand right steady. You keep every law. And why in the hell shouldn't you? Who in the hell has done all the bleeding for this country? And this law? And this constitution anyhow but your fellows? General Smedley Bootler, United States Marine Corps, retired, ripped his fist through the air to emphasize his last point, and paused to take a breath before continuing. A roar of applause from several thousand men split the hot summer afternoon, and Cam Bowman felt the hair on his arms stand up. General Bootler's words were lifting Bowman's spirits in a way he would not have thought possible 12 hours earlier. The slender, sinewy retired officer stared out at the 14,000 veterans of the Great War and prepared to continue. He had an angular, hawk-like face, and everyone except those at the very back could see the burning intensity in the man's eyes as he spoke. Bootler wore rumpled civilian clothing, twill trousers with suspenders, a colorful tie, and a white dress shirt with the sleeves halfway rolled up. His bushy elbows danced as he went on with his speech. But don't, don't take a step back. Remember that as soon as you haul down your camp flag here and clear out of this thing, every one of you clears out, this evaporates in thin air, and all this struggle will have been no good. All around him, Cam Bowman could see veterans nodding at the general's words. He found he was standing straight, as if at attention. I've come a thousand miles, and camped out here on the mud flats for almost two months, he told himself. I'm not going to give up just yet. Cameron Wilcox Bowman was a veteran, and like all U.S. veterans of the Great War, he had been promised a bonus by the United States government. The bonus was one dollar for every day of active service in the United States Army during the war, and a dollar fifty for every day of service overseas payable in the year 1945. The total payment due in that year was over three billion dollars. 1932 had been the worst year yet of the Great Depression, and many veterans realized they might well be dead by 1945. The situation was especially grim for those from farming communities. The typical farm in the first part of the century was 160 acres, which, not coincidentally, was the amount of land allotted by the Homestead Act of 1862. These farms, for the most part, were self-sufficient and produced a modest surplus that their owners sold. In the late 1920s, however, many farmers began assuming large amounts of debt from ill-advised expansion, and the disastrous Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act of 1930 brought U.S. tariffs to an all-time high. Soaring debt and plummeting demand for what they produced was a devastating combination for farmers and the situation was exacerbated by the drought that swept the Midwest. Thousands of farmers were driven into bankruptcy, and starvation loomed for many families. In the spring, a young veteran from Oregon, Walter H. Waters, had led a group of 300 veterans across the country to peacefully assemble in Washington District of Columbia. There, the Bonus Expeditionary Force, as they called themselves, hoped to persuade Congress to authorize immediate payment of the bonus money that they so desperately needed. Cam Bowman had lost his farm in Missouri the previous year. He had joined Waters' group and been among the first 2,000 veterans to arrive in the nation's capital. The veterans had set up living quarters in several abandoned buildings on Pennsylvania Avenue. But as hundreds of World War veterans poured into the capital daily, much more space was needed. In response, Washington police cleared a patch of ground on the mud flats near the town of Anacostia, on the other side of the Anacostia River from the city of Washington. The location suited the administration.
for the veterans were separated from the city by the river, and any who wanted to assemble in the city proper had to cross the bridge and complete a substantial march first. It was here that Cam Bowman and other veterans camped in makeshift dwellings made of cardboard, sheet tin, and scrap lumber. By mid-June, over 10,000 veterans were living on the flats in what would become the nation's largest and most famous Hooverville. In addition to these men were several hundred wives and children that had come along with them for the journey. On June 15, 1932, the House of Representatives voted to authorize early payment of the veterans' bonus. Two days later, the Senate took up the bill and overwhelmingly killed it. The bonus marchers were stunned. In the weeks that ensued, veterans continued to pour in from every corner of the country, and the ranks of the bonus marchers swelled to over 20,000 veterans. Legislators left the Capitol and otherwise ducked the issue. Senator Connolly's proposal to pay the veterans the present value of their 1945 bonus lost 11 to 4. Senator Thomas of Oklahoma, whose constituents were especially destitute, proposed that monies be paid early to those veterans who could present proof of absolute want. Thomas's motion met with a similar fate. In mid-July, Congress adjourned without any further action on the issue. The bonus army stayed, hoping for a miracle. There were three remarkable things about the bonus army's 20,000-person assembly on the Anacostia Flats. The first was that while Washington, D.C. and each branch of the armed forces were themselves strictly segregated, the bonus army was not. White and Negro veterans and their families lived side by side in makeshift hovels on the flats and the New York Times published an article entitled, The Bonusiers Ban Jim Crow. The second remarkable thing was that the veterans in the Bonus Army, by universal agreement, were completely unarmed. No member of the Bonus Expeditionary Force had brought anything more lethal than a penknife to Washington. This was not for lack of ability. Virtually every veteran after the end of the Great War owned at least one military-issue firearm, and most, like Cam Bowman, owned several, including machine guns. Some had sold their guns out of poverty, but war trophies were worth next to nothing when people needed every dollar for food. Most of the veterans' weapons sat in attics of friends and relatives who were still able to make mortgage payments, and the array of armaments that the veterans did not bring to D.C. was startling. The third remarkable thing was that no legislator had proposed the obvious solution which would have solved the problem without increasing the government's financial obligation by a single dollar or altering its schedule of payments in any way. Now, in spite of the adjournment, General Butler was urging the veterans to keep the faith and stay camped on the flats. Cam Bowman looked at the other men around him. I guess Butler thinks maybe a miracle will happen, he thought. I've come this far. I'll see it through to the end. What Cam Bowman did not know was that the government had its own agenda concerning the Bonus Army. Cam Bowman had less than three weeks left to live. End Chapter 4, Veterans Bonus Strike, Washington, D.C. Chapter 5, General MacArthur's Burning Us Out, July 28, 1932. Jesus Christ, they're coming to kill us all, thought Cam Bowman as shouts of alarm rose throughout the group. The veterans had been silently shuffling around the capital in what had come to be known as the Death March. It was an eerie thing to watch. Earlier, soldiers had thrown tear gas canisters at the bonus marchers. The veterans, who were destitute but had not forgotten their training, easily tossed them back. Tear gas was nothing for a soldier to get excited about. What was coming next was another matter. When the veterans saw what was approaching them now, Many were wrenched back into the horror they had experienced 15 years before. Advancing towards the unarmed marchers were scores of soldiers equipped with gas masks and carrying rifles at port arms with bayonets fixed. Behind the foot soldiers rode cavalry soldiers with sabers drawn. Behind the horse soldiers rolled a number of whippet tanks. It was the tanks that did it. Some of the bonus marchers who had been inspired by General Butler's words and who had stood firm even after Congress had adjourned 
now turned and ran. They ran out of the capital, heading for the bridge that crossed the Anacostia River and the safety of the camp. Lieutenant Cameron Wilcox Bowman stood his ground and waited as the cavalry approached. A mounted soldier singled him out, and Bowman stared him straight in the eye as the soldier, ten years his senior, drew back his saber. Bowman refused to believe that this man, a fellow officer in the United States Army, was going to kill him. He was determined not to flinch, no matter what the horse soldier did. As the blade of the saber sliced through the air, however, Lieutenant Bowman's instincts overrode his brain, and he reflexively threw his left arm up to prevent the blade from decapitating him. The soldiers had been instructed by their commander to clear the bonus marchers out of the area by striking them with the flats of their saber's blades, not the cutting edge. And this is what the cavalrymen did. It was like being struck by a three-foot steel bar, and Lieutenant Cameron Bowman's left wrist was shattered like kindling. He did not cry out or fall down, but when Bowman saw the soldier prepare to deliver a second blow, he finally accepted his fate and gave ground. As he made his way towards the bridge, his ruined wrist beginning to scream in agony, Bowman saw three men leading the armed troops, and he was stunned by what he saw. He did not recognize the two army majors who would both later come to prominence. The man in charge of leading the infantrymen, cavalry, and second division, however, was impossible to miss. The lesser-ranked officers were Major George S. Patton and Major Dwight D. Eisenhower. The senior officer was the Chief of Staff of the United States Armed Forces, General Douglas T. MacArthur. Cam Bowman huddled on his filthy blanket. His body was drenched in sweat. He had wrapped a dirty scrap of cloth around his damaged wrist, but one of the bones was poking through the skin, and the rag was soaked with blood. All around him, people were running, and he wasn't always sure if the screams he was hearing were those of others or if they were his own. It was almost midnight, and though he knew he was delirious, the screaming intensified, and there was a distinct smell. It isn't my imagination. Tear gas, of course, but also... Oh no. Wood smoke. He squeezed his eyes shut and willed it to be May again. Willed it to be a dream. Willed this all to be anything but the true horror he knew was coming. Oh, sweet Jesus, Lieutenant Cameron Bowman softly said aloud. His voice was a cracked whisper of utter despair. General MacArthur's burning us out. General MacArthur's burning us out. End chapter five. General MacArthur's burning us out. Chapter six. A fortuitous marriage. May 10th, 1936. Are you sure this is really what you want, Sophia? The middle-aged woman's eyes showed great sadness as she looked at her daughter. An American. I'm sure he's a fine young man, but you cannot speak a word of English. And to go live in New York. Her voice trailed off as she squeezed her hands together, ignoring the arthritis in her fingers. You had no such fears when I went to London, mother. English is the language of that country as well, and I will learn it in time. I was fine in London. Does it surprise you so that I would meet my future husband there? But an American, Sophia, her mother pleaded, and he is four years younger than you. To live in New York, where there are so many other... She searched for the gentlest phrase and finally said, American women, and trailed off without elaborating further. The sound of defeat was plain in her voice. Her daughter jumped to her feet. <laughs> you think I won't be good enough for him? You think he must be crazy to want to marry an old Polish woman, and in a little while he will come to his senses and run off with an American girl who deserves him? Is that what you think? Zofia Sezupak's nostrils were flared, and her voice shook with outrage. She was practically screaming. And it was because her mother had touched on the one thing that absolutely terrified the young woman. Why had Maxwell Collins asked her to marry him? Was it on impulse? Would he soon regret it? These questions had kept her awake for long hours every night since his proposal three weeks prior. Zofia was 27, which was hardly dried up, but she was definitely older than most single women she knew. When Max had noticed her and asked her to dance that first night in the London nightclub, 
she realized he was the most exciting man she had ever seen in her entire life. His presence was absolutely overwhelming to both men and women alike. She had made him understand that she did not speak English. He had nodded, then through her friend Kristen, who was fluent in both languages, had told her that in one week he would be able to speak Polish. And he had. From the moment he had said, is this good enough? Or should I go back to the books before I ask you again? In her native tongue, she had been smitten. And she knew, though she tried not to think of it, that she was not the first woman who had ever been smitten by this man, and would not be the last. She was, however, the one he had asked to marry him. She was not going to turn that chance down. <sighs> she took a deep breath before she spoke again. When she did, her tone was soft and understanding. I know you're worried, Mother. I understand that. I am sorry that you fear what may happen to us, but... But I think you know that my mind is made up. Will you not give both of us your love and blessing, and wish us well? The old woman's eyes filled with tears. Oh, of course I will, Kokachini. How could I do anything else? She embraced her daughter and pulled the girl's face close to her own. Go with God, my child. Magda Sezupak had been sitting quietly in the corner of the room as her older sister and her mother talked of the pending marriage. At 17, Magda was the baby of the family, and she was absolutely thrilled at her mother's final acceptance of her older sister's romance with the American. The teenager's excitement was not because of a special bond she shared with her older sibling, for the 10-year age difference had prevented them from being together to any great extent as Magda had grown up. Her excitement was also not because of any romantic ideas she might have conjured up about a man she had never met. Magda Suzupak had something much larger at stake here, and of considerably more personal interest. Magda Suzupak had a boyfriend, and she had not yet told her mother about him. He was not Polish. He was German. And she had met him two months before in Danzig. Erwin Mann, at 19, was the handsomest, kindest, most thrilling young man that Magda had ever met, and she was sure that she would marry him. Magda jumped up and ran over to kiss her sister. Zofia thought it was in congratulation of her coming wedding. In reality, it was the little sister thanking Zofia for breaking the ground for her own startling news that would soon arrive in due time. In several weeks, Zofia Suzupak would sail for New York and would soon be living in a small apartment with her new husband. She would spend the rest of her long life in the United States of America. Her own fears, and those of her mother, would prove to be well-founded. Max Collins was a decent man, and the fact that his wife was Polish and would never speak English terribly well would not be the cause of Zofia's heartache. The problem, as Zofia had feared, was that people were drawn to Max Collins, and when these people happened to be women, he responded to them in kind, and his getting married did not change that fact. Magda Zupak would marry Erwin Mann the following year and help him operate a small grocery store in Danzig. Erwin would remain utterly devoted to his wife and she to him. Throughout her life, Zofia Suzupak would always wish that her own marriage could have been more like she envisioned her little sister's being. Yet in later years, Zofia Suzupak would also never forget that Maxwell Collins gave her something that ultimately was worth more than anything else that the rest of her family possessed. Max Collins had brought her to America. Zofia Suzupak would be living in comfort in the United States of America, well-nourished and with a sharp mind, when every one of her blood relatives had been dead for over 50 years. For the boy that her sister Magda had met and would soon marry that fall was not only a German. Erwin Mann was also a Jew. End Chapter 6 A Fortuitous Marriage Chapter 7 Moonshine Running A Test Case for the National Firearms Act of 1934 June 22nd, 1938 The Treasury agent did not like being in the woods. Anderson always thought of an Indian moving silently among the twigs, leaves, and other natural detritus, and his own clumsy efforts at stealth came up woefully short of this imagined standard. The agent much preferred to enforce the law back in Little Rock, 
where there were paved streets to drive on with real maps and road signs to tell you where you were, warehouses with real addresses when you had to bust in somewhere, and snitches to let you know what to expect when you got to where the bad guys were. That had been the environment in which he had operated for nine years, and it had suited him well. He had racked up an extensive arrest record and had been quite proud of it. All that had changed five years ago. No more following midnight deliveries made by drab vehicles with bogus furniture company lettering on the sides. Now the drivers for Anhauser Busch drove big red trucks with the company logo on them and they smiled at him when they pulled in town to make their delivery runs from St. Louis. He didn't disagree with the reasons for a repeal. Anderson had seen from his very first day on the job that as long as there were people who wanted to drink liquor, there would always be other people to see to it that they could buy whatever booze they wanted. If buying liquor was illegal, that meant that the people providing it would not be mere businessmen, but businessmen that were willing to break the law as a basic, necessary matter of business policy. And sometimes that meant killing people. Since repeal five years before, he had yet to hear of a licensed beer or liquor distributor getting into a gun battle with a competitor. Anderson's displeasure with the repeal of prohibition was purely selfish in nature, and he did not try to tell himself otherwise. I had it good for nine years. I could blend in when I went out on a case. I knew what was waiting for me when I went through a door. I knew who would pay off and who had to go down. And the guys we were after were making so much dough that they knew it was a minor setback and that their lawyers would get them sprung. Just part of the cost of doing business. <sighs> the man squinted and looked over to where his partner was standing behind a tree, studying a topographical map. Now... <sighs> Now I'm stuck here, God knows where, chasing after illiterate hillbillies so dirt poor that the only way they can get by is to cook up this stuff and sell it to people who can't afford the real thing because the government puts a big tax on it. <laughs> and when one of them goes down, it may mean that his family is going to starve to death, so he might as well shoot me in the back from behind a tree before I can make the collar. The treasury agent took a few deep breaths. <sighs> He didn't like this at all. I'm banking only a third of what I was five years ago, with ten times the risk of ending up in an unmarked grave out here in the middle of godforsaken nowhere. Maybe I can get transferred to counterfeiting detail, he thought, for perhaps the hundredth time. He uttered an oath under his breath. Fucking hell. <sighs> Have you figured out where we are? The man asked his partner. Agent Turner glanced up from the map. He was new to the department and some 15 years younger than his companion. Since he had arrived at Treasury well after the repeal of Prohibition, Agent Turner did not have the basis for comparison that his partner did, and so did not view this job with the same loathing. Agent Turner had also not yet felt the lure of bribes, payoffs, and untraceable money that are always present whenever lucrative criminal enterprises exist. Agent Turner, at that moment, was concentrating on the job at hand. We need to go up that valley about 400 yards, Turner said quietly, nodding his head to indicate the direction, and climb the hill on the right. It's flat on top, and there's supposed to be a small clearing where he's got his still. Anderson grunted in acknowledgement. Hmm. He had heard the briefing about how the equipment was hidden on top of the hill. The department had leaned on some other wretched hillbilly, and he had ratted out his friend in the hopes of getting a reduced sentence. The road he uses comes up from the other side, Turner continued, and we should be out of sight until we're almost on top of him. If he's there, Turner added as an afterthought. If he's not there, then we'll damn well wait for the sorry bastard, Agent Anderson asserted. I'm not going to come out here and play Daniel Boone lest we go back with a collar. I'll lead. Turner offered as he started to walk methodically towards the valley. Kid knows I hate going first in the woods, Anderson thought with mild irritation. Agent Anderson said nothing as he fell in behind the younger man. He found his partner's upbeat attitude vaguely irritating, but he was happy to let Turner lead the way. Let the kid get his ass shot first, Anderson thought sourly. 
That'll give me a chance to hear where this hillbilly is hiding in this fucking jungle. He instinctively ran his hands over the butt of his service revolver, a 38 caliber Smith & Weston military and police model with six-inch barrel that he carried under his coat. The old man looked bleakly at his partner's back. Agent Turner seemed to be covering ground without making much noise at all. Agent Anderson grimaced as his next step caused a twig to snap with an audible crack. <sighs> he wished there were more than just the two of them. He wished he were sitting in the car they had left two miles away, smoking a cigarette. Most of all, Agent Anderson wished he were back in his office in Little Rock, pouring himself a stiff jolt of Irish whiskey so he could forget about even looking for ignorant, inbred, white trash moonshiners. It took the two treasury agents the better part of an hour to traverse the valley and climb the hill. They stopped regularly to get their bearings and try to spot any signs of human life, but there were none. The only other creatures around them were the mosquitoes they had slapped away, and the unidentified insects that did not bother them but provided a constant backdrop of buzzing and chirping noise which helped a little to muffle the sounds of their progress. At Agent Turner's insistence, they crawled the last hundred yards to the top of the hill. Squirming on his belly through dead leaves did nothing to improve Agent Anderson's outlook on the assignment. As they finally reached the last few yards before the summit, the two Treasury agents slowed their progress to where they were only moving an inch or two at a time. Suddenly, Turner shoved his hands back towards his partner, silently commanding him to stop moving and lie still. He turned his head around slowly and whispered, I can see the top of it. It's about 30 yards away. It's hidden in some trees, but I can see the cooling coils. Wait here. Turner crawled a few feet further to a spot where he could peer over a fallen log at the top of the hill. He turned to Anderson. I don't see any sign of anybody. He whispered softly. Come on up. Agent Anderson grunted and heaved himself to his feet. His partner tried to silently protest, but Anderson ignored him and walked up to where Agent Turner lay behind the log. He squatted next to the younger man and nodded. Well done, Boone. Looks like you got us to the right place. Agent Turner smiled at the rare compliment. What do we do now? Go over the setup? The older man shook his head. I don't want to leave any tracks that could scare our boy off when he comes up here. For all I know, every son of a bitch that lives in these hills can tell at a glance if a mouse has walked by. Also, he may have a booby trap set. Turner nodded his agreement. The risk of being killed in the line of duty was universally accepted, but it was every agent's nightmare to be blinded or crippled by a criminal's efforts to protect his property. It didn't happen often, but it did happen. And both men knew it. Let's find us a good spot to watch from, and sit on our asses for a while. I'm sick of crawling around like a damn lizard. Agent Anderson brushed the dirt from his pants and looked around for a suitable spot to begin their vigil. Over there, Turner said, looking at a large oak tree with a dead tree lying at the base of its trunk. We can sit behind that log there and still see where he'll have to drive up. Anderson considered the suggestion and nodded. The two men walked over behind the oak tree and the log and sat down. Without discussion, they faced slightly away from each other to afford themselves the ability to survey a wider area. Silently, they settled down to wait. Anderson was in a foul mood from the many mosquitoes he had suffered, and the fact that after two hours his bowels had demanded relief. There had been no alternative but to walk down the hill, find a log, and use leaves in place of toilet paper he had neglected to bring. He had caught Turner grinning when he returned, and that hadn't helped his attitude at all. He was about to say something when the younger man held up his hand. Listen. The two men heard the unmistakable sound of a vehicle laboring in low gear, slowly making its way up the opposite side of the hill. Both agents were fully alert now, staying completely still and waiting for their quarry to come into sight. The old truck suddenly came into view about 70 yards away. Anderson and Turner followed its progress as it vanished and reappeared several times from their field of vision through the patchy foliage. There were two occupants. The truck stopped next to the group of trees that concealed the illegal still, 20 yards in front of the two agents. The driver backed the vehicle around until it was facing away from them, and they could see the bed of the truck. It was empty. 
The door opened, and a tired-looking man got out of the cab. He looked around absent-mindedly and trudged towards the clump of trees. He wore torn, faded overalls and had several days' worth of beard growth on his lined face. He was joined by the second man, who was a bit younger. Anderson and Turner heard rustling noises, then grunts of effort. In a few moments, the men emerged from behind the trees. They each carried a heavy sack, and each man's body was bent under his burden. The first man was carefully stepping over a fallen log on his way to the truck when Anderson stood up. His back was to his partner, and he did not see the worried look on the younger man's face. Agent Turner had just realized that something was wrong with what he was seeing. Turner reached up to stop his partner, but it was too late. Agent Anderson was already running after the men with his gun drawn. Freeze! Federal agents! You're under arrest! Anderson bellowed as he broke into the clearing. The men with the sacks on their shoulders stopped dead and waited. Anderson stopped 15 feet from them with his gun held out in front of him in his right hand. Turn around slowly. Don't move your hands or I'll put a big hole right in the middle of each of you. The men turned slowly to face their captors. Are you Jack Miller? Agent Anderson demanded of the man who had been driving the truck. The man nodded silently. Put that sack down slowly and keep your hands where I can see them. Miller did as he was told. Now you, he said to the second man, who also complied. What's your name? Frank Layton, he said sullenly. Agent Turner was moving away from his partner, over to where the still was hidden behind the clump of trees. He dreaded what he thought he would find there. What's in the sack? Agent Anderson demanded. Turner closed his eyes with dismay. He knew what Miller's answer would be. Sugar, Miller said simply, as the younger Treasury agent had known he would. The young Treasury agent stood staring at what had once been an operating still. The copper condensing coil was still intact, but the boiler had been destroyed years ago, as was evidenced by the collection of rust on the big gashes that made it inoperable. Next to the ruined relic were some heavy tarpaulins. One of them was folded back to reveal several neatly stacked hundred-pound bags of sugar. There's no still here. What? Anderson yelled, forgetting his training and turning his head to look at where Turner was standing. Agent Turner walked over to his partner. The still that's there hasn't been in operation for years. All they've got is some sugar bags stored under a tarp. Looks like our boy didn't give us the location of Miller's real still after all. Turner walked slowly over to Miller's battered truck while keeping a careful eye on its owner. Jack Miller's eyes narrowed and Anderson saw a tight, humorless smile cross his face for a brief moment. Miller stayed where he was and said nothing to the city men in suits. Agent Anderson walked over to the ruined still. His face showed undisguised disgust and hatred. He shook his head in disbelief as he pulled back the tarp in the vain hope that there might be something illegal under it. More sacks of sugar. That's all. Fuck! Anderson spat out the word. It's no crime to have a shitload of sugar, even if all four of us know exactly what you two were planning to do with it. Get your miserable asses out of here. Jack Miller and his companion turned towards the truck, but Agent Turner blocked their way. Turner was holding the shotgun that had been on the truck's passenger seat. Where did you fellows come from? The agent asked. Miller and Frank Layton stared at each other. Finally, Miller said, Oklahoma. The agent held up the double barrel shotgun. Miller licked his lips as realization set in. The man was going to kill them with Miller's own gun and leave them here, and there wasn't a thing they could do about it. Then the agent smiled opened the action to remove the two shells, and looked at Anderson. Partner, we've got our caller. We're not going home empty-handed after all. Anderson shook his head. It's no crime to have a shotgun in your truck, and I'll be damned if I'm going to lie and say these stupid hillbillies threatened me with it. I don't have the stomach for that kind of thing. No, no, you're missing it. National Firearms Act, federal violation, passed in 34. Illegal possession and interstate transport of an unregistered shotgun with a barrel less than 18 inches long. Jack Miller, who normally knew enough not to speak to law enforcement agents, could not contain himself. Illegal possession? Hell! That's my gun! Can't nobody say different! I've never stolen a thing in my life! This last was not entirely accurate, 
but it was true that Mr. Miller had indeed acquired the gun legally. Agent Anderson was looking even more bewildered than Jack Miller, though less outraged. What in the hell are you talking about? The National Firearms Act of 1934, passed in June of that year, he was grinning broadly now, playing to his audience. What we have here is the illegal possession and interstate transportation of an unregistered shotgun with a barrel less than 18 inches in length or an overall length of less than 26 inches. He held up the shotgun. The barrel was about 16 inches long, maybe a bit more. Registration of said weapon must be made with the United States Treasury and a $200 tax paid to the Treasury. After registration, subsequent sale of said weapon must be first approved by the Department of the Treasury and will be subject to a $200 tax payable to the Treasury by the seller each time the weapon changes hands. Agent Turner was grinning like a Cheshire cat. So unless either Mr. Miller or Mr. Layton here can produce registration papers for this weapon, I'd say we've got ourselves a couple of federal criminals. Miller, a poor man with little formal education, had jerked as if jolted with electricity at the mention of the dollar figure. Oh, you mean I gots to pay $200 to you federal men if and I decide to sell that $5 shotgun to my friend here? The concept was beyond his comprehension. Agent Turner smiled patiently. Well, that would be true, Mr. Miller. If you or your friend had already paid $200 to the Treasury in 1934 when the law was passed and registered this gun with us at that time, since you did not, you and Mr. Layton are guilty of illegal possession and interstate transportation of an unregistered weapon controlled by the National Firearms Act of 1934 and you are each therefore subject to a fine of $5,000 and a prison sentence of five years. Now turn around and cross your wrists behind your back. Miller's jaw dropped in disbelief, but he did as he was told. Agent Turner took the chromed steel handcuffs from the case on his belt and locked them around Jack Miller's wrists. Go get in the front of the truck, he commanded. Miller obeyed. You gonna cuff the other one? He asked his partner. Agent Anderson cuffed Leighton and pushed him towards the truck. Then he stared at his younger partner and grabbed him by the shoulder. Just what the fuck kind of crazy, made-up, horseshit story did you tell those peckerheads? You expect them to believe they're going to prison for five years because the barrel on a shotgun is an inch and a half shorter than you said it should be? Anderson spoke in a coarse whisper, his mouth only inches from his partner's ear. The chief will have our fucking balls for making a false arrest. Special Agent Turner continued to smile as he shook his head patiently. Not what I said it should be. What the federal government says it should be. No horseshit at all. It's federal law. And now we've got our caller. Come on, he said soothingly. Let's see if this old rattletrap can make it back to our car. He started walking towards the vehicle. The older agent followed him slowly, shaking his head in utter disbelief and disgust. Prohibition had been crazy enough, but this? <laughs> Five years in prison because a piece of steel was two inches too short? He hated this job now more than ever. Anderson's final words were lost as Turner ground the starter and the tired engine coughed to life. I'd sooner a gut shot the fuckers and left them for the buzzards. <laughs> Fucking hell. End chapter seven. Chapter eight. A fortuitous birth. September 8th. 1938. Bud! Bud, come here! Come in here right now! I don't believe this! You've, you've got to see it! The woman's face was a mixture of amazement and delight. Her husband, a lean, strong man of 32, heard the urgency in her voice immediately and came trotting over from the barn, wiping grease from his hand with a rag. He started to speak, but as he reached the doorway, he saw what had so astonished his wife. He was walking! Only eight months old, and little Raymond was walking. Bud put his arm around his wife's waist and hugged her to him. His smile was as broad as it had been when he had seen his son for the first time 28 weeks prior. I don't believe it, he whispered, shaking his head slowly. Raymond was taking small, careful steps. His arms were held out for balance, and he was looking towards the floor. He was oblivious to the presence of his parents. All of a sudden, he lost his balance and his knees buckled. 
The baby sat down abruptly on the thin carpet. His mother gasped and started towards him, but her husband held her back. Wait, let's see what he does. The child inhaled, and for a moment, his parents thought he was going to cry. But Raymond's eyes were alert, and he looked at his immediate surroundings. He focused on the overstuffed armchair two feet away from him and crawled towards it. With awkward but purposeful movements, the little boy clutched the fabric of the chair at his fingers and used it to steady himself as he pushed himself to a standing position yet again. Slowly, one hand at a time, he let go of the chair and took two wobbling steps. He stopped, holding his arms out like a tightrope walker, and stayed on his feet. He turned his head and saw his father, and an enormous grin filled his face. He made a loud, happy noise and started to lose his balance again. Emmett Bud Johnson couldn't help himself. He grabbed his little boy under his arms and he started to fall, threw him up in the air, caught him, and hugged the small body to his chest. Look who can walk! Look who's got tired of crawling already! Is it time to get you a little pair of boots? Is it time to give you a whittle pitchfork so you can help with the horses? Are you going to help us out at rodeo time? He tossed the little boy in the air again, and Raymond's smile got even bigger as the child let out a little giggle. <laughs> Louise always felt her heart in her chest when Bud did that, but she had long ago given up on trying to get her husband to stop throwing her son in the air. Raymond obviously loved it, and Bud had insisted with a straight face that it would help their child have a better balance and prevent him from being afraid of things that he shouldn't be afraid of, as her husband had explained it. Maybe he had been right. She was still marveling at the fact of her little boy taking his first steps. Bud and Louise Johnson had been married for nine years, and they had been trying to have a child ever since their wedding night. Louise had suffered three miscarriages in that time, and her doctor had told her that her body was not built for having children. He had told her that childbirth, if she were able to carry a pregnancy to term, might well kill her. She had been adamant and had forbidden the doctor to tell her husband of his fears. When Raymond was born, there had been severe complications, and the doctor had had to perform a cesarean section. Bud had been frightened out of his mind that his wife would die. Raymond had been healthy, if small, but Louise could not have any more children. That reality had ground on her for the past seven months. She had come from a large family and always expected to have one herself. Bud put Raymond down next to the armchair where the little boy could hold onto it for balance. He turned to his wife and hugged her to him. Honey, I know we wanted a girl too, but I'm beginning to think that this little fella here might be about all that just the two of us can handle. Louise's eyes brimmed with tears. For seven months, she had feared that Bud was unhappy with the prospect of always having only one child. I have a feeling this one's going to amount to a lot more than just a cow puncher. <laughs> Louise looked up at her husband in amazement. She had never heard him run himself down before. He saw her expression and smiled before explaining. I don't mean anything bad by it. There isn't a place I'd rather live or a life I'd rather lead. And you know that. I'm just lucky our kind of life suits me as well as it does. Because you and I both know it was a stretch for me to get through high school. This one here, he said, nodding to Raymond, you can see it in his eyes. He's smart. He wants to do things. I could see that as soon as you got home from the hospital. And that's not just a proud daddy puffing up his chest. I've seen enough other babies to know. Raymond's got a double helping of something pretty strong in him. He's going to have the chance to be things we've never even dreamt of. There was obvious pride in the man's voice. Louise nodded. She'd seen it too but she had assumed that every new mother felt that way about her firstborn. She glanced at her husband, who had a pensive look on his face. Better get used to the idea of not getting to see him grow up all the way. What? She turned to face her husband, a horrified look on her face. He saw her alarm and quickly explained. I just mean that I think our Pitkin County schools are going to take him only so far. I think he's going to outgrow them. And if I'm right, we're going to make sure he goes someplace where the teachers are smarter than he is. But he's only eight months old, <laughs> Louise said laughing. Yet even as she said the words, Louise found herself inwardly agreeing with Bud's surprising declaration. 
He'll be 15 before you know it. <laughs> Hell, woman. It seems like only yesterday I was trying to put my hand up your dress for the first time. Louise flushed scarlet. Emmett Johnson, she squealed. She always used his given name whenever he said something shocking that nonetheless pleased her. His fingers went to the buttons of her blouse. Raymond's got himself occupied learning how to walk. Let's go practice something on our own. But just this morning we already... Her voice trailed off at the touch of his fingertips. That's right, darling. And I want to make damn sure I don't forget how. Like I told you, I never was much for brains. It'd be a real shame if I went a little too long and all the things that you like me to do just kind of slipped my mind. We'd best get some practice in so as your thick-headed husband doesn't disappoint you some night when you're feeling frisky. <laughs> he scooped her up easily and carried her over to the big couch. Mmm, she breathed. You're right about that. We don't want that to happen. She glanced over at the little boy. Raymond was using the chair again so that he could stand up. Louise closed her eyes and moaned softly. Her husband, Bud, was accomplishing something entirely different. End Chapter 8. A Fortuitous Birth. Chapter 9. Kristallnacht. November 9th, 1938. There was no warning at all. One moment the watch repair shop on Burgerstrasse was quiet and peaceful, occupied only by its owner. An instant later, the storefront window vanished, imploding inwards in a shower of glass shards under the force of three expertly wielded truncheons. Before the jagged pieces had all come to rest on the drab but immaculate shop floor, the watchmaker knew. He knew that the whispers he had been pretending didn't exist were true. He knew that the hope he had held out had been utter self-deception. He knew that however bad things were going to be tonight, they would get much worse in the days and months to come. He had talked, oh, how endlessly he had talked, to the other Munich shop owners and merchants in the area. They had all agreed that it was nothing to worry about. The sentiments that were building were nothing new. Hadn't they always been resented for their business skills? Hadn't they always succeeded in commerce, and part of that success meant accepting hostility? They had agreed to do nothing, for taking action might bring them harm. That was what they had all agreed, and the watchmaker now saw with absolute clarity the fate to which they had consigned themselves. Schnell! Schnell! came the harsh voices of the three uniformed men stepping over the windowsill into his shop. Filthy Jewish swine! Get over here! You are under arrest! The man did not protest. He knew it would only enrage these animals further. He knew that any resistance would be an excuse to use their truncheons on his old bones, and he doubted that his body would hold up any better than his storefront window had. He knew that the only thing to do was go along and pray for the best. He thought of his favorite nephew, Erwin Mann, who lived in Danzig and sold produce and tinned goods. He had always hoped Erwin would prosper as he had. <sighs> now look who's the prosperous one, he thought bitterly. He did not know that in four years, his nephew would be relocated to Warsaw and soon find himself faced with a similar problem. Young Erwin Mann, however, would respond in a very different manner than had his uncle. The future of his nephew and the role the young man would play in history was only one of the many things the watchmaker did not know. He did not know that in addition to being arrested that night, he would also be fined for damage to his own shop. He did not know that there would be 20,000 others like him arrested in the next 48 hours. He did not know that he would never again be a free man. He most certainly did not know that within a year, he would weigh less than half his current 68 kilos, that most of his fingers and toes would have been lost to frostbite and gangrene, and that when he finally died of internal bleeding, he would have lived the last seven weeks of his life as a blind man. He did not know but would come to learn that he would soon spend the rest of his life, all 16 months of it, in a facility not 20 kilometers northwest of his Munich watch repair shop, just outside of a town on the Amper River. The town was a small one, over 500 years old, whose previous innocuous name had recently taken on a sinister air whenever Germans spoke of it. The watchmaker shared a fate with almost a quarter million of his countrymen, 
and every single one of his relatives who was still in Germany as of November 9, 1938. He was going to Dachau. End Chapter 9. Kristallnacht. Chapter 10. United States v. Miller et al. Test Case for the National Firearms Act of 1934. January 3rd, 1939. All rise. District Court, West District of Arkansas, Fort Smith Division, is now in session. Judge Hartsill Reagan presiding. You may be seated. First case, United States v. Miller et al. Mr. Guntinson? Right here, Your Honor. The defense lawyer from Fort Smith stood up. Paul Guntinson was a smallish man with thinning black hair who wore round, wire-rimmed spectacles. His quick movements and his sharp, prominent nose gave him a slightly hawkish appearance. Your Honor, if it please the court, my clients, Mr. Miller and Mr. Layton, are guilty of no crime whatsoever. Their arrest under Section 11, Subsection 48, Statute 1239, is clearly in violation of their constitutional rights for two obvious reasons. First, the so-called National Firearms Act, though presented as a revenue measure, is clearly a federal attempt to usurp power reserved to the states. This should be obvious as the so-called tax of $200 is greatly in excess of the value of the arms on which it is levied. Second, the National Firearms Act of 1934 is completely in conflict with the second article of our Constitution's Bill of Rights. To wit, a well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Inasmuch as both Mr. Miller and Mr. Layton are able-bodied and between the ages of 16 and 45, they are clearly members of the militia of which the framers of our Constitution spoke. Furthermore, unlike the Fourth Amendment against unreasonable search and seizure, the Second Amendment makes no mention of reasonable infringements on the people's rights to keep and bear arms. The article states that this right shall not be infringed, period. There is no way to interpret our government's attempts to levy a tax of $200 on any weapon which can be used to defend oneself and one's freedoms as anything other than a gross and willful infringement on the people's rights to keep and bear arms. Mr. Miller and Mr. Layton are guilty of nothing more than exercising their Second Amendment rights. Indeed, the arresting agents reported that both my clients obeyed all orders given by the agents, and that at no time did either of the defendants threaten either agent in any way, with or without the weapon in question. In fact, the agents both admitted that the shotgun in question was found by one of the agents on the seat of Mr. Miller's unoccupied vehicle when the arrest was made. Accordingly, I have filed a demurrer challenging the sufficiency of the facts stated in the indictment to constitute a crime, and further challenging the sections under which said indictment was returned as being in contravention of the Second Amendment to the Constitution of the United States of America, USCA. You have the demurrer before you, Your Honor. Guntinson sat down. District Judge Hartsill Reagan looked at the slender man and his two clients. He had read the demurrer already, and it had been a rare experience for him. He could not recall the last time that he had felt so strongly in this particular way about a case presented before him. He had seen numerous cases where the arresting officers had lied, made up charges, manufactured evidence, and beaten suspects into confessing. This case was not like that. The Treasury agents who had arrested the two men had behaved properly in every possible way. Their arrest procedures had been straight out of the textbook. The problem with this case was why the two men had been arrested in the first place. Judge Reagan knew that the reason the Treasury agents had followed the defendants was to catch them making liquor without a license. He also knew that due to bad luck, there hadn't been any moonshine to be found when the agents had sprung their trap. But the agents hadn't let the men go. No, the agents had acted in a reasonable and prudent manner when they had arrested Miller and Layton for being in clear violation of a federal statute. The problem with this case was that defense counsel was exactly right. The federal statute, the National Firearms Act of 1934, was absolutely and unquestionably in violation of the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution. 
Judge Hartzell Reagan paused a moment to reflect on the men in the federal legislature who had created this piece of legal garbage. <laughs> what kind of person would propose that a man be put in prison for five years based on the length of the weapon he carried to protect himself? What kind of person would expect the man to pay 20 times the value of the weapon to the treasury for each such weapon he owned to avoid going to prison? and then pay the $200 again when he sold the gun. What kind of legislature had agreed to this insanity? <sighs> the law was even worse than this case would indicate, the judge reflected. He had taken the time to read all the provisions of the 1934 statute, and Judge Reagan had been amazed at what he had seen. In addition to throwing people in prison if they didn't pay $200 taxes on $10 guns, the National Firearms Act put people in prison if they failed to pay $200 taxes on $3 sound mufflers. This was a cruel addition to an already terrible law. Judge Reagan had spent his entire adult life studying the law and had not fired a gun since his service in the war with Spain in 1898. But that was not the case with his three brothers. All three of the now middle-aged men had fired guns their whole lives and all three were now almost completely deaf, and there was nothing that any doctor could do about it. What was next? wondered the judge. $200 taxes on knives? <laughs> judge Reagan took a deep breath and looked at the U.S. District Attorney, C.R. Barry. Mr. District Attorney? Your Honor, the National Firearms Act of 1934 is not in any way in contravention with our United States Constitution. The defendants were found transporting a sawed-off shotgun in interstate commerce. Neither defendant disputes this fact. Nowhere in the United States is a sawn-off shotgun of the type transported by Mr. Miller and Mr. Layton issued to members of the military. Accordingly, it is entirely reasonable that the Treasury enforce the National Firearms Act as a revenue-raising measure and demand that those who are in violation of it be sent to prison just as we tax liquor producers and expect those people who make illegal alcohol products to be sent to prison. The judge smiled at the DA, but it was entirely without humor. Mr. Barry, he said in a resonant voice, there is no mention made in the Constitution of the United States about making whiskey. There is a very clear mention made of the right to keep and bear arms. You may be entirely right that our government does not issue our soldiers shotguns of the exact type that Mr. Miller had in his truck. However, you are forgetting everything you were taught in grade school civics class. The district attorney turned crimson at this barb. The judge went on. A militia, by definition, is a group of citizens who use their own weapons for defense of themselves and their freedoms. We cannot throw them in prison or fine them $5,000 for failing to have exactly the same type of arms as are carried by the National Guard or any other branch of our standing army. Nor can we expect them to pay $200 taxes at the whim of the Treasury merely for exercising their constitutional rights. But, Your Honor, Mr. Barry, I have carefully reviewed this National Firearms Act of yours, and it imposes the same five-year prison sentence and $5,000 fine on interstate transport of automatic weapons as well. The district attorney got a sick look on his face. He knew where this was going. Tell me then, Mr. Barry, are you familiar with the Browning automatic rifle, the model of 1918 Bar? Yes, Your Honor. So am I. In fact, my son carried one in France at the very end of the Great War. A marvelous weapon, and one he could well have used at the beginning of the war and not just at the end. In fact, the BAR is a weapon which I wish I'd had when I fought in the war with Spain in 1898. And, Mr. District Attorney, the Browning automatic rifle is, I believe, currently issued to United States soldiers and members of the Arkansas National Guard. Is it not? I believe so, Your Honor. Mr. Barry, if the Treasury agents had found a BAR and not a shotgun in Mr. Miller's truck, would they have arrested him for violating the National Firearms Act? Sir, I can't say what the agents would or wouldn't have done, Your Honor. I'll rephrase the question then, Mr. Barry. If the agents had arrested Miller and Layton for possessing a Browning automatic rifle without having paid a $200 tax and without possessing the stamp affixed Federal Order Form as per this National Firearms Act, 
Would you be prosecuting them under the National Firearms Act as you are now doing? The district attorney licked his lips nervously. How the hell do I answer this one? Well, Mr. Barry, they would be in violation of the act, so yes, I would prosecute them, Your Honor. <clears throat> and if I happen to have a Browning automatic rifle at home in my bedroom, the very same type of weapon that my son carried proudly defending our country in 1918, and if this weapon in my bedroom was not stolen from a government arsenal, but rather one that I had bought with my own money from the Colt factory in 1920 so that I would be prepared to act as a member of the militia or to defend myself from an abusive government should the need arise, and if I had brought this BAR here to my Arkansas bedroom from my former residence outside the state, would you prosecute me for violating the National Firearms Act and recommend that I be thrown in prison for five years, Mr. District Attorney? The DA was sweating despite the cool air in the courtroom. Your Honor, I would never prosecute someone who has not been arrested. And if I were arrested, Mr. District Attorney, should I then go to prison for five years, pay a $5,000 fine, and be disparred according to you and your National Firearms Act? Your Honor, he said, holding his hands palm up and pleading with the judge, the Treasury agents would never arrest you. And why not? thundered Judge Reagan. Because I'm a judge? Because I'm not a moonshiner? Mr. District Attorney, I see no exemptions in this National Firearms Act for judges or any other categories of the people to which our Bill of Rights refers. Do you? No, Your Honor, Barry said softly. I didn't think so. I believe you understand my position clearly then, Mr. District Attorney. Mr. Gunterson? he said, addressing the defense lawyer. The demurrer you filed is accordingly sustained. The National Firearms Act of 1934 violates the Second Amendment to the Constitution of the United States of America. He banged his gavel once upon the bench. Case dismissed. Mr. Miller and Mr. Layton, you are free to go. Paul Gunterson stood up. His heart was racing. There was no feeling like this one. Winning a case on a technicality or insufficient evidence was one thing. This was so much better. He, Paul Gunterson, had seen the law which had been applied to his clients was in fundamental violation of their rights, and he had made it stick. A piece of illegal federal legislation had been struck down because of his efforts, and his efforts alone. This was better than money. Hell, he thought recklessly, it's better than sex. Jack Miller and Frank Layton stood in front of him. They were wearing their best clothes, which was to say they each looked a little more shabby than the people in the back of the courtroom. Miller twisted his hat in his calloused hands. He was obviously relieved at the decision, but also anxious about what he wanted to tell his lawyer. We made it, didn't we? Gunterson said, clapping Miller on the back with a broad grin. Jack Miller looked slightly embarrassed. Mr. Gunterson, Miller began awkwardly. I never did feel right about you agreeing to do all this work on your own just because you thought what them federal men had done wasn't right. I didn't have no money when we first talked, and you said no matter. Well, that ain't the way I ever done things. Here, he said, thrusting his hand out to the lawyer. It probably ain't what you got coming to you, but it's all I got. It ain't been stole. Paul Gunterson took the handful of bills. He had seen this before. Sometimes it was five or ten dollars in ones, sometimes a side of beef, a slab of bacon, or fresh vegetables from a client's garden. The lawyer looked at the money and was startled to see it was six twenty-dollar bills. This is probably the most money this man has ever had in his hands at any one time in his entire life, Gunterson thought. He looked up uncertainly at Miller. Jack Miller gave an embarrassed smile. I figure it's a sight better than going to prison and having my family left with no way to get by. And it's less than what them federal men said I was supposed to give them back in 34, to keep my gun. Gunterson smiled and nodded once. Miller looked relieved, and quickly put on his hat. We gotta go, he said quickly. He and Frank Layton walked out of the courtroom. Paul Gunterson picked up his valise and looked around the courtroom with satisfaction. His step was light and his pace even quicker than usual as he walked out of the building and into the chilly January air. Normally, he hated cold weather, 
but for some reason it felt invigorating today. He looked up into the clear blue sky and fingered the bills in the pants pocket of his gray suit. <sighs> it's great to be alive, he thought happily. End chapter 10. Chapter 11. United States v. Miller ruling appealed. March 6th, 1939. Morning, Paul. Welcome back to our wonderful Arkansas weather. <laughs> right, I was thinking I should have stayed in Mississippi. What I miss while I was off being the dutiful son. Did you sell our practice? <laughs> I wish. No, it's been pretty quiet around here. Got one lover's quarrel late last week. Guy belted his lady friend, cracked her jaw. Her dad's making her press charges. I'm representing Romeo, if it ever gets to court. What's your defense? You know, the usual. Typical shouting match that went a little too far. This is the first time it's ever happened, Your Honor. Don't throw my client in the jug. He has a steady job and will, of course, make restitution. Blah, 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 the usual drill. Oh, I almost forgot. Just after you left, that case you nailed just after New Year's on constitutional grounds? The feds have appealed it to the Supreme Court. I tried for almost a week to track down your buddy Jack Miller, but the guy's vanished off the face of the earth and no one has a clue where to find him. Same with that Frank Layton fellow. The notice is right there on top of your pile of mail. <sighs> Paul Gunterson sighed as he picked up the notice of appeal. This was the last thing he wanted to hear first thing on Monday after being out of the office for two straight weeks. He looked at the court date for the case, Thursday, March 30th, three weeks. He folded the document and put it back in the envelope. So what are you going to do? I don't know. Try to find out where Miller is, I guess? Although I doubt he'll be up for another round in court, especially a thousand miles from here in Washington, D.C. I can't say I have any burning desire to hop on a train and pay for a hotel room for Lord knows how long. Whatever Mr. Miller's desires might be, providing I can find him, I don't think paying my expenses are within his budget to say nothing of the actual legal fees. You gonna file a brief on his behalf? Mail it to him? <sighs> Paul Gunterson sighed again. This was starting to give him a headache. I don't know. I ought to, but you know the rules. The US Supreme Court won't accept typed briefs. They're above all that. For them, you have to get your briefs printed. I'm not eager to pay for that out of my own pocket either. I think we're at the point where we're not going to do these charity cases anymore. He thought for a moment before continuing. I'll try to get a hold of Mr. Miller and Mr. Layton. Maybe I can convince one of them that paying for a little more of my time and effort is good insurance against having their case overturned. You think the feds have much of a shot? Gunterson shrugged. I don't think so. Reagan laid it out pretty plainly in his Western District ruling. That National Firearms Act is garbage, completely unconstitutional. You know, I think maybe they passed it because with Prohibition gone, all those Treasury agents needed something to enforce. <laughs> he chuckled to himself. You ever hear of our government laying a bunch of their own people off? His partner laughed out loud. <laughs> Fair point. Ever since our current president seized power, I haven't been able to keep up with the alphabet soup of three-letter government programs, and you know, that socialist bastard would never have managed to get any of his schemes passed into law without packing the Supreme Court first. What's that they're saying now? Something like, become a Roosevelt Democrat? It beats having a real job? <laughs> the partner's tone became more serious. To answer your question, Paul, no. I can't imagine the Treasury Department laying off three-fourths of its agents just because there isn't the Fulstead Act to enforce anymore. They have to have a boogeyman to go after. I looked at your case, though. It was ironclad. I don't see how the Supreme Court could reverse, even if King George himself were Chief Justice. Paul Gunterson's partner didn't know it, but he had just delivered what would prove to be the worst legal opinion of his entire career. End Chapter 11 Chapter 12 Miller Skips Court March 30th, 1939 the Supreme Court of the United States is now in session. Chief Justice McReynolds presiding. United States v. Miller et al. Mr. Gordon Dean for the United States. For the appellees? Chief Justice McReynolds looked around the courtroom. No one volunteered to speak for Jack Miller or Frank Layton, because no one was there on their behalf. Well then, 
Mr. Dean? Gordon Dean took a deep breath. He had prayed that no opposing legal counsel would show up, and when he had learned that no brief had been filed, he realized that his prayers had been answered. An opponent to challenge what he was about to say would have doomed his argument. Without opposition, there was a chance he could squeak by. All it would take was some creative manipulation of the facts and some monumental omissions. Yes, Your Honor. If it please the court, the district court's prior dismissal of this case and ruling that the National Firearms Act is in contravention to our Constitution has no rational basis in law. The National Firearms Act levies a tax on the interstate commerce in sawn-off shotguns and affixes a federal stamp to the order as proof that the tax has been paid. Mr. Miller and Mr. Layton transported in interstate commerce a sawn-off shotgun without having in their possession a stamp affixed written order for the firearm. That fact is not in dispute. The weapon that Mr. Miller and Layton transported in interstate commerce a double-barrel Stevens 12-gauge shotgun having a minimum barrel length less than 18 inches and bearing serial number 76230 is not issued to any military entity anywhere in our country. To say that this weapon is part of any well-regulated militia is utter nonsense. Gordon Dean knew he had just stretched the truth about as far as he ever had in his professional life. Short-barreled shotguns had been used in every military engagement in the last 50 years, but what Dean had actually said was that the serial number 76230 was not government issue, so it wasn't a lie. That's what the lawyer told himself at any rate. The United States lawyer looked into the eyes of each of the Supreme Court justices and felt a trickle of sweat run down his spine. He was searching for any sign that one of these men had seen military service and had used a shotgun with a barrel shorter than 18 inches. If any one of them has, he's going to skin me alive, Dean thought, before he pressed on. The National Firearms Act is, once again, a revenue-raising measure. It raises monies for the Treasury by levying a tax on certain weapons. Mr. Miller's right to keep and bear arms was in no way infringed. He was merely required to pay a tax on a weapon that has no relationship whatsoever to a militia. Mr. Miller could have paid this tax, and he would have committed no crime. He also could have chosen to transport a different weapon across state lines, such as a military rifle, and again he would have committed no crime. He failed to pay this tax, and then transported the NFA-controlled weapon in interstate commerce. This is a crime, pure and simple. You have the government's brief, Your Honor. Gordon Dean held his breath. He was dreading the inevitable question about the National Firearms Act also restricting interstate commerce in automatic military firearms. He also dreaded the question of how a $200 tax on a $10 gun could be anything but an infringement on the right to keep the weapon. As he stood there in front of the United States Supreme Court, he could not help but think about the purpose of the second article in the Bill of Rights. The Second Amendment is a recognition of the danger of standing armies. Its purpose is to recognize that every citizen has the right to keep and bear the same type of basic arms as a soldier in a modern military. A militia embodies all able-bodied men over the age of 16. Therefore, a militia will always outnumber a standing army by at least 20 to 1. If this militia is armed with weapons similar to those used by individuals comprising the standing army, it will be impossible for that standing army to inflict the will of a tyrannical government upon the people. The Second Amendment is the guarantee behind all the other articles in the United States Constitution's Bill of Rights. It is the ultimate guarantee that citizens in the United States of America shall remain free. Gordon Dean waited for the justices to look at the wording of the National Firearms Act and ask him, based on his own arguments, how the act could restrict private commerce in not only Stevens shotgun serial number 76230, but also the exact weapons currently issued to infantrymen in our military. If I'm not cut out for lying to the Supreme Court, this isn't what I had in mind when I went to law school, he thought. Thank God there's no opposing counsel to bring out the truth. He was beginning to feel physically ill. The questions from the Supreme Justices never came. End chapter 12. Chapter 13. United States v. Miller overturned. NFA upheld.
May 15th, 1939. World events were coming to a head. The Munich Conference had been held eight months earlier, and British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain had made his famous claim of having secured peace in our time by acceding to Hitler's demand to occupy western Czechoslovakia with German troops. Although most Americans did not even know how to spell Czechoslovakia, let alone care what happened between it and Germany, in three and a half months, the little man with the toothbrush mustache would start the invasion of Poland. America would soon agree with Winston Churchill's assessment of the seriousness of the Axis threat. Those national sentiments were months in the future on this Monday in May, however. On this spring morning, the Supreme Court would issue a ruling that virtually no one at the time would notice. Further, the ultimate results of the decision would not fully be felt by U.S. citizens for many decades to come. The court had spent considerable time reviewing the government's brief in the case. It was not often that a district court ruled that a federal law was unconstitutional. It was even rarer that one of the participants not even show up to argue its side of a Supreme Court case, or file a brief on behalf of the client. Still, the court considered the government's position in the fairest way that it could, without assuming any facts or statements not presented. The decision, unlike most Supreme Court decisions that would come in future years, was only four pages long. The reasoning behind the court's decision was contained in the second paragraph. Quote, in the absence of any evidence tending to show that possession or use of a shotgun having a barrel less than 18 inches in length at this time has some reasonable relationship to the preservation or efficiency of a well-regulated militia, we cannot say that the Second Amendment guarantees the rights to keep and bear such an instrument. Certainly, it is not within judicial notice that this weapon is any part of the ordinary military equipment or that its use could contribute to the common defense. Gordon Dean's straw man argument had worked. Without opposing counsel, the court was never told that shotguns with barrels of less than 18 inches were used in the military. The court was never informed that the National Firearms Act applied to automatic weapons that were obviously military issue which would have killed the government's own argument right then and there. Finally, no one had pointed out, as had District Court Judge Hartzell Reagan, that militia weapons were, by definition, the personal arms of the private citizenry, and therefore, whether or not a particular weapon was issued to army troops was completely irrelevant. The language of the decision would ultimately cause the government much trouble. However, the wording clearly showed that the Supreme Court viewed all military issues small arms as being constitutionally protected. Since the National Firearms Act infringed upon the citizens' rights to keep and bear many obviously military issues small arms, the court should have found the act unconstitutional. But the court did not know about this element of the act, and so the National Firearms Act remained on the books as part of federal law. Jack Miller and Frank Layton innocent men the day before, were once again guilty of a federal crime. They had no known address, however, and in 1939, tracking down a couple of poor Arkansas hillbillies because a year earlier they had a piece of steel shorter than a certain length was not top priority for Treasury agents. Jack Miller and Frank Layton were never seen again by law enforcement authorities. In 1939, few if any people complained about the National Firearms Act, just as few people complained about the much more obvious Jim Crow laws that existed throughout the country. Just like the doctrine of separate but equal, the National Firearms Act would remain an embarrassing stain on the nation's fabric for over half a century. Just as with that other civil rights violation, the National Firearms Act would spawn other, more outrageous infringements, like a tumor that slowly metastasizes into ever-widening and ever-more aggressive forms of cancer. Finally, as was true of civil rights violations everywhere in the world, the choice would come down to eradicating the cancer or letting it kill the patient. That decision, however, would not happen for more than 50 years. When it did, it would be precipitated by several people who, on that May afternoon in 1939, had not yet been born, and one who was then only a year old. End chapter 13. This concludes part one of Unintended Consequences by John Ross.
entitled Part 1, Seeds. Recording completed Monday, November 18th, 2019. Thank you for listening. Auf Wiedersehen.